Thanks, Ron. Um, okay, so I just want to go ahead and get started and just think about some of the issues that are grounding this research. So we all know we're living in this, this world where social cloud and mobile computing has created this situation where people are generating and manipulating and sharing digital content at larger scales and faster rates than ever before. And so we've all experienced the wonderful kind of effects of this. So it enables us to create kind of collections of digital materials that capture our life stories um, and experiences with others um, in a variety of ways. Um, and also these kinds of materials are really useful and important for remembering and reflecting on our own lives and social relationships. Uh, but over the past several years, um, within the HCI community, there's been these kind of growing concerns over how this trend towards rapid production and accumulation of personal digital content might complicate the longer term significance of these materials. So just as a simple example, we know that as personal digital archives grow larger, they become more difficult to get a grasp on exactly how big they are, where they are, or really even what's captured within them. And so again, this can just kind of complicate people's practices of remembering past life experiences um, and social relationships. So very recently, really over the past couple of years, there's been a handful of recent studies that have started to suggest that slow technologies or kind of slower interaction patterns with one's uh, personal archive, um, things that we could call kind of slow media systems, can open up meaningful forms of interacting and experiencing digital content in terms of really kind of reflecting on the past and thinking about it. Um, so I'm not going to really be able to go into all the details of each of these studies. There's kind of a lot more details in the paper about that. Um, but what I do want to say is that each of these works really are starting to offer some promising results. They're showing that if we can kind of slow down interaction and maybe place emphasis on particular points in the archive, um, this could be one viable way of thinking about uh, their longer term significance in our lives. Um, but one thing I want to draw your attention to is the amount of time these studies have taken place. And this, these are kind of actually for good reasons. This is methodologically a very difficult space to operate in, but it's often like six weeks three weeks, even in the case of the photo box, which was 14 months, when we really think about the longevity of a person's lifespan, that's really not a long period of time to think about what the longer term effects might be of these kinds of systems. Um, so they start to raise some really interesting questions for HCI. So these questions that are quite fundamental, like, well, what kinds of experiences might emerge with long term interactions with a slow media technology? Or how do these encounters intersect with people's memory practices, again, over a longer period of time? And really, what would this even mean for researching or designing slow media systems or just interactive systems in general that kind of capture people's life experiences? So to explore these questions, I conducted a qualitative study of people's experiences with the Future Me website. So you can see it's incredibly simple. All it is is a website that you can send an email with text in it or one photo, or a combination of text and one photo, to your future self or someone else that can be delayed up to 60 years into the future. That's essentially it. It's super simple. Um, now, one key thing about the design is that once a message is sent, it can never be seen again. You can delete it, but it can never be seen again. Um, and another small detail is that you can only kind of send this the message to someone else that has an account within FutureMe, but the email, the message is actually come to your email account, so just like any other email. Um, so what's interesting about this system is that it's been in use for over 12 years, actually 13 years now, by more than 1 million people, so the scale is quite huge, and nearly 3.7 million photos or messages, or a combination of both, have been sent through it. So this presents this unusually rare opportunity to really start to think about what might be the longer term effects of a slow technology. So in terms of the study, um, I really aim to recruit as diverse a sample as possible here. I mean, so there were a number of different countries that are represented, a range of ages, a number of occupations. Um, and so just a, a few key points about the people. So there were two criteria. One was that they had used FutureMe for at least three years, but some people use it for up to 11 years. And the other is that all had sent or received at least one message that was delayed by at least one year. And so I was really, all the data has to do with people that had um, experienced this kind of longer term uh, sense of sending or receiving messages. 
So the findings ended up being quite um, diverse, unexpected. There were moments of epiphany to profound reminiscence to unusual experiences and even dark and unsettling encounters. And so really I can't capture uh, the diversity of this within this presentation. Uh, so I'm really actually gonna skip over some substantive points of the data and just really try to give you an overall sense of what kind of happened here. What was the story? What were some of the narratives? So just in terms of some general perceptions, um, many of the participants across the age groups really kind of relied on, spoke about how the simple limitation of not being able to see or edit their messages after they were sent led to this deeper consideration for crafting this kind of content that was sent through the, the system. So here, one of the oldest participants, that was 75 years old, says, well, back in my day, people could only write letters. You have to slow down and let your thoughts out. Email and text don't hold up the same way. Future me isn't like that. Once it's sent, I'm not going to be able to change it. So I'd, be, I'd better think good and hard about what's going into it. Um, and so while participants of these various ages kind of use different metaphors to describe this, this was kind of a common theme. So this is a kind of intentionality that came with this kind of time delayed limitation, um, really actually created a sense of weight and gravity to the content that was received. Um, so again, just like a really kind of quick glimpse at some of the um, experiences of sending the slow media to oneself into the future. Um, so, perhaps unsurprisingly, one of the main reasons participants used FutureMe was to generate um, and capture memories so that they could re-encounter later. Um, and so several participants drew on these kind of key distinctions between how this kind of slow media content contrasted some of the other things that they had. And so, here in this example that I'm going to offer, um, this participant, Tim, who had used Future Me for over 10 years, described this practice that emerged of him annually writing a kind of a life synopsis of the year's events prior, which was sent to himself and slowed by one year. And so in this quote, he reflects on nine emails that he now possesses that were really kind of these, these life synopsis things. So he says, well, they've grown to become an interesting portrait of who I was. They each speak to different parts of me, they're way more valuable to me than 9,000 photos documenting everything that happened in between them. So interestingly, in, in, aside from just trying to capture uh, experiences um, from one's past, participants also described sending themselves slow digital content in attempts to actually influence the future. So kind of trying to, to, to make a change on what was happening in their future. And so this really ranged from very kind of simply sending positive messages or kind of funny things to try to influence their mood to much more serious things. So in this case, this participant reflects on many emails that she had sent in the past that were starting three years prior and that were staggered by six months um, while she was in the grips of battling drug addiction. And so here she says, well, writing those emails helped keep me going. When I'd get one, I'd think I can make it to the next one. I still get them twice a year. It's a stinging reminder, but it's good. I don't ever want to be back there again. Um, and so it is worth noting also in another case, participants kind of did have some negative effects when re-encountering these things. It wasn't always kind of a positive outcome. So now I want to move on to really kind of emphasizing some of the things that came out of when these slow delayed messages were sent to others. So again, another common factor was that motivated participants was to send slow media to someone else as a way of, kind of deliberately capturing social experiences that maybe were lost over time. But interestingly and kind of unexpectedly, um, so this slow media was used also to work through issues in a relationship that people perceived needed time. So here several participants sent slow media that disclosed sensitive information um, into the future to someone else to motivate themselves to eventually work through a difficult relationship issue before that slow media arrived. Mm -hmm. So um, interestingly, this kind of played out in a variety of ways and there's some really rich examples in the paper, but this was actually um, in all of the kind of qualitative work I've ever done, one of the most touching examples and interviews that I conducted. And so here um, Arnold describes sending a two year delayed message to his parents in which he revealed he was gay. So it's really this hard thing that he was working through. And so here he says, well, sitting down and writing that message and sending it, knowing they're going to get it, to, going, going, going to get it, save me the motivation to finally do it. It actually went well. And so here he's saying later, I didn't tell them about the message and they got it and they were pretty touched. Um, so this was, yeah, quite an interesting, unexpected thing that occurred. 
Um, but also, slow media sometimes rate conflicts over the past and how it was remembered by two people. So here, this participant from Mexico says, well, my cousin sent me his memory of a camping weekend our families had. There was this part about how I let our campfire go out one night, but I'm sure he let it go out. I thought he was joking, but he wasn't. It made me wonder if I'm crazy. We still disagree about it. Um, so it seems like actually kind of a mundane example, but this was also a kind of something that started to emerge over time across many interviews. There was, there was this sense of disagreement and confusion that persisted on, and it really highlights how digital records of the past can trigger the sense of re-accountability over a past event that really had been put to rest or probably wouldn't have re-emerged. So another major issue that came up was when slow media was delivered um, to senders, to other people when the senders' lifetime had already passed. So there were some actually quite touching, wonderful examples of this. So in this case, Jenny says, is reflecting on a touching email she received from her father five years after his death. So she says, well, it brought up a lot of emotions. He mostly wanted to make sure I knew he's still watching over me. Getting it after such a long time made me cherish the memories of him even more. It's one of the most special things I have from him. But some instances turned out very differently. Um, so here, Shelley describes receiving an unpredictable series of slow media messages from her departed sister that were ambiguous and troubling. So here she says, well, some were about her regrets, others didn't make any sense, and they kept coming. It's not like she left a note, it's haunting. I want to know why she doesn't want to let things be. So this, in this case and in one other, um, participants described eventually closing their accounts entirely to kind of shut down this kind of asymmetrical kind of communication that was going on. There was no really room to, to respond to this kind of stuff. And so finally, I just want to offer a couple examples of how people thought about um, the kinds of things that they were receiving through Future Me. So interestingly, there were kind of different perspectives here. So on one hand, across interviews, perceptions really tended to differ, um, but we saw many, in many cases people remarked on how the kind of extraordinary nature of slow media content was embodied and stored in this rather kind of banal or maybe unexpressive form of an email. So here Samantha says, well, they're gems, they are, really, but my email account is a rubbish dump, and that doesn't, quil quite, doesn't feel quite right at the end of the day. But... On the other hand, several other participants reported actually valuing the fact that their slow digital content was becoming introduced into their email stream. So here, Jessica says, I don't mind, it's how memories work. They're all fleeting. Of course, I enjoy engaging with them, but then more emails pile up, they get buried, slowly disappear. Um, and so in other instances, participants even desire to have more control over having their slow media content fade away entirely. Um, so now I just want to move on to kind of the last part of this presentation and just kind of summing up what this brief glimpse was at the study. Um, and I really want to emphasize that the main contribution of this study was to try to take a step forward to unpacking what some of the longer term experiential qualities of a slow media technology might be. Um, and so the complexity and intensity of the results made me actually quite hesitant to suggest more prescriptive design implications here. Um, not to say it doesn't suggest a lot of bigger issues that we will need to grapple with, but just suggesting kind of one design directional way forward could be really misguided. And I think that this work tries to say that we need to think more critically in general about the role that systems that we design um, play in shaping human experiences of remembering and reminiscence of ourselves and our social relationships. So with that in mind, I just want to touch on two opportunity areas just for thinking about how we might move forward. So one is about the need to actually explicitly investigate divergent design strategies. We don't want to commit to one direction. Um, and so in one case, we f in, in several cases, one opportunity could be um, the fact that slow media content often provided this really unique index, or as some participants said, kind of a good marker of significant points in a person's life. So there could be an opportunity of using these unique indexes outside of the slow media system in general to locate significant digital content, maybe from particular points in a person's life, to create these kind of new and more concise and coherent archives related to particular experiences or particular life stories. Um, 
And so what's interesting here is that, well, they could be kind of cherished and go on, and maybe there's kind of this romantic notion of that, or maybe they could be deleted entirely. The idea is actually just giving people more autonomy in managing, say, the, the memories that are captured by digital technology. And the second point really speaks to the fact that we need more expressive and deliberate ways of making slow media impermanent. Even though it resurfaces in our lives, it's really, we don't want to create things that could just be another thing to manage. Um, and the last point I really want to touch on here is that we tend to think of intimacy being linked with immediacy. But in this case, temporality really produced some rather profound and unexpected effects. And so HCI has previously explored how intimacy might be mediated over space and time on largely or often speculative levels um, and through conceptual designs. Um, but this study really starts to give some empirical grounding to some bigger issues that HCI is inevitably going to have to face, um, especially as we start to think about the longer term role of technologies in general in mediating how we remember ourselves and our lives. Um, so just want to say, obviously, HCI has done a great job at making interactions with digital content more intuitive and supporting intimacy across vast distances. And of course, this is going to remain important. But the real aim of this work in this paper is to really try to say that we need more efforts to unpack the profound effects that result from longer term interactions with media systems. And so I hope that this might just be one small step and only one approach of bringing the subject of human relations with technology over time more seriously into focus in the HCI community. So if you have questions, please come up. We have two microphones in the room and uh, just can say who you are and where your affiliation and please speak in the microphone. We have time for a couple of questions. Hello, I'm Cosima Ruginish from the University of Bucharest. You have uh, interpreted this system in the time frame as a slow technology. To me personally, it speaks more like a technology which imposes constraints on oneself. And I wanted to ask you whether, so whether you, s you are familiar of other s this so uh, sorts of technologies which people serve like to limit their freedom in order to increase their freedom in a way. To restrict communication now in order to have a more meaningful communication la later. So this way of using self-limitations in order to enhance one authenticity, liberty, or one way or another. Thank you. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, that's a great point. Um, and clearly, this idea of limitations, constraints, slowness, uh, time, temporality, they're all really kind of bound together, um, really probably under a much bigger banner. Um, and so, absolutely, I mean, I, I think that that's one interpretation. Um, the idea of kind of framing it within slow technology is just kind of a lens for trying to think about and speculate on the kind of the bigger consequences of a lot of the kind of quite interesting speculative designs that are coming out. Um, and certainly it speaks to and looks to build on to and be parallel to the works that are about kind of limitations and creativity and other kinds of experiences that can come out from that. Um, hi, Gunnar Harbo, University of Zurich. Um, really interesting talk. Uh, I thought uh, one thing that occurred to me was that you, in the prototype, it, or in the system, it said, uh, send a note to your future self. But it, people actually used it to send messages to other people. Was that uh, kind of an alternative use, something you had anticipated, or was it unexpected to you? And do you have any thoughts about why, why people appropriated it in that, that way? I mean, I think it's just because uh, in terms of, so it's not appropriated. That's a part of the, the, the like it's always been a part of the feature of the system. Okay. Um, and. Certainly, I mean, it's just kind of humans are doing what the humans always do, which is wanting to connect with other okay. people. 